It's my great pleasure to introduce Jody Dean, who is Professor of Political Science at Hobart and William Smith College in Geneva, New York, and co-editor of the journal Theory and Events, as well as an author, or the author, sorry, an editor of many books and publications, including Blog Theory, Feedback and Capture in the Circuits of Desire, Democracy, sorry, Drive, that was parapraxis inserting itself into the horizon. Um, democracy and other neoliberal fantasies, and Zizek's politics. She was Erasmus Chair in the Humanities in the Faculty of Philosophy at Erasmus University in Rotterdam, and Jody's talk today is titled The Communist Horizon. Yeah, there. The second former West Research Congress invites us to think with the idea of horizon. The invitation construes our horizon as a temporal one, a future toward which we once aspired. This lost horizon connotes privation, depletion, the loss of projects, goals, and utopias that oriented us toward the future. In the wake of this loss, we are asked to consider whether another world is possible, another horizon imaginable. I initially understood the term horizon in a more mundane, spatial fashion as the line dividing the visible, separating earth from sky. The horizon demarcates a fundamental division that we experience as impossible to reach, that we can neither escape nor cross. Horizon thus tags not a lost future, but a dimension of experience we can never lose, even if lost in a fog or focused on our feet, we fail to see it. The horizon is real, not just in the sense of impossible, we can never reach it, but also in the sense of the actual format, condition, and shape of our setting. And I take both of these senses of real to be Lacanian. We can lose our bearings, but the horizon is a necessary condition or shaping of our actuality. The horizon is the fundamental division establishing where we are. With respect to politics, the necessary and unavoidable horizon that conditions and curves our experience is communism. We might be tempted to think of this communist horizon as a lost horizon, and so to adopt capitalist and liberal democratic rhetoric about the defeat of communism. This would be a mistake, a mistake that capitalists, conservatives, and even some liberal democrats don't make insofar as they see the threat of communism everywhere. 20 years after its ostensible demise. The communist horizon isn't lost, it's real. To think further about how this communist horizon manifests itself to us today, how we feel its force, how it formats our setting, I treat communism as a tag for five features of our current conjuncture. One, a specific state formation that collapsed in 1989. Two, a present increasingly powerful force Three, the sovereignty of the people. Four, the force of the common and commons. And five, the actuality of revolution. One, communism, the Soviet system. It's safe to say that for most folks in the US, the most conventional referent of communism is the Soviet Union. To say this, though, is to start complicating matters. The Soviet Union did not claim to have reached communism, rather its ruling party called itself a communist party. As in the case with any party or political system, the communist party in the Soviet Union changed over time, moving from a revolutionary party to a governing bureaucratic party, a governing bureaucratic party that also experienced changes over time, changes that were sometimes violent, sometimes incremental. Insofar as it was a political party, and for the most of its history the only recognized political party, the Communist Party in the Soviet Union was a locus of struggle and disagreement over a host of issues from art, literature, and science to economic development, foreign policy, and internal relations among the various republics. In short, my point here is that the Soviet Union isn't a very stable referent of communism. Accordingly, it tends to be stabilized via the proper name of Stalin, where Stalinist tags practices of monopolizing and consolidating power in the state party bureaucracy. Communism as Stalinism, then, is marked by authoritarianism, prison camps, and the inadmissibility of criticism. It also tends to eclipse post-Stalinist developments in the Soviet Union, 
particularly with regard to successes in modernizing and improving overall standards of living. In the US, two interlocking stories of the collapse of communism predominate. The first is that communism collapsed under its own weight. It was so inefficient, people were so miserable, life was so stagnant that the system came to a grinding halt. It failed. The second related story Americans tell of the collapse of communism is that it was defeated. We beat them. We won. Capitalism and liberal democracy, and the elision is necessary, demonstrated their superiority on the world historical stage. Freedom triumphed over tyranny. The details of this victory matter less than its ostensible undeniability. After all, there is no Soviet Union anymore. If the end of the Soviet Union were the same as the end of communism, if 1989 marked a temporal horizon separating the time of the Soviets from the present, then communism would be past, like the Roman or the Ottoman Empire. As a particular political formation, it would be an artifact to be analyzed and studied. Whatever gave it breath, made it real, would be gone. It would be a dead political language. Yet communism persists. It's a living presence or possibility. In the US, communism is a term of opprobrium so frequently used that one would think the Cold War never ended. What's a communist? Na national health care, environmentalism, feminism, public education, progressive taxation, paid vacation days, gun control. Bicycles are a gateway drug to communism. <laughs> One right-wing commentator called Web 2.0 communist because it holds out, quote, the seductive promise of individual self-realization that Karl Marx evoked in the German ideology. Who's a communist? Anyone who protested US military aggression in Iraq and Afghanistan, anyone critical of the Bush administration, major democratic political leaders such as former Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi, and of course Barack Obama. It's obvious enough that contemporary Democrats are not communists. The Democratic Party did not even attempt to pass a single payer health, public health insurance program. Instead, folks are required to buy insurance from private companies. Its response to the economic crisis focused on the finance sector. The constant evocations of an encroaching communist threat in the US could thus seem to be a not very creative return to the language of the Cold War and Red Scare, a conservative retreat to a formally effective rhetoric of fear. In a recent article in New Left Review, Slavoj Žižek emphasizes that the ruling ideology today wants us to think that radical change is impossible. This might be true in Britain. This ideology, Zizek tells us, is that it's impossible to abolish capitalism, to have a different, non-corrupt instantiation of democracy. In reiterating this message, the dominant ideology attempts, quote, to render invisible the impossible real of the antagonism that cuts across capitalist societies, end quote. I disagree. Zizek's description might have worked a decade or so ago, but not anymore. In the US, we are reminded daily that radical change is possible, and we are incited to fear it. Right-wing radio and blogs scream about the threat or specter of communism. If we don't do something, we will be under the communist yoke. So the right, even the center, regularly invokes the possibility of radical change, and it names that change communism. And why does the right name the change communism? because the gross inequality ushered in by rampant neoliberalism, let's call it despotic financialism, is visible, undeniable, and global. Increasing in industrialized countries over the last three decades, income inequality is particularly severe in Mexico, Turkey, and the US, the three industrialized countries with the largest income gaps. The income of the richest is 25 times that of the poorest in Mexico, 17 times that of the poorest in Turkey, and 16 times that of the poorest in the US, according to a 2008 report. The antagonism that cuts across capitalist countries is increasingly apparent. Dominant ideological forces can't obscure it. They name it, and they name it communism. Typically, the US has positioned extreme inequality, indebtedness, and decay elsewhere, offshore. The economic recession, collapse in the housing and mortgage markets, increase in permanent involuntary unemployment, and trillion dollar bank bailouts have made what we in the US thought was the third world into our world. 
So contra Zizek, the division cutting across capitalist societies is in fact more visible, more palpable in the US now than it's been since at least the 1920s. We learn that, our, that more of our children live in poverty than at any time in US history that the wealth of the very, very rich, the top 1%, has dramatically increased while income for the rest of us has remained stagnant or declined, that many of the foreclosures the bank force on homeowners are meaningless, illegal acts of expropriation. Um, the banks can't document who owns what, so they lack the paper trail necessary to justify foreclosure proceedings. We read of corporations sitting on piles of cash instead of hiring back their laid-off workforce. Admittedly, U.S. popular media rarely refer to the super-rich as the bourgeoisie and the rest of us as proletarians. They're more likely to use terms like Wall Street versus Main Street. Sometimes they avoid a direct contrast between two hostile forces, instead juxtaposing bank bonuses with strapped consumers looking for bargains or cutting back on spending. Other times the media report lists of billionaires, more in 2010 than in 2009, although the, less, the rest of us were less well off. The richest one is in Mexico. There are 28 billionaires in Turkey. In a culture where the mantra for over 50 years has been, what's good for business is good for America, and where since the presidency of Ronald Reagan, we've been urged to believe that inequality is good because what benefits the rich trickles down to the rest of us, the current undeniability of division isn't nothing. It's something. Inequality is appearing as a factor a force, a crime. No wonder then that we're hearing the name communism, precisely because the antagonism cutting across capitalist societies is visible, palpable, pressing. The right, even the center, tries to evoke communism as a threat, something to warn, warn against, a terrible past we should all hasten to avoid. But if it was so terrible, and if it was in the past, why is it still a threat? Because the right, in its neoliberal and neoconservative guises, realizes that communism is the alternative, the remedy, the answer to our current economic crisis. As David Harvey explains, capitalists these days construe a healthy economy as one that grows about 3% a year. The likelihood of continued 3% annual growth in the world economy, however, is small. This is in part because of the difficulty of reassorbing the capitalist surplus. For example, by 2030, it would be necessary to find investment opportunities for $3 trillion, roughly twice what was needed in 2010. The future of capitalism is thus highly uncertain, and for capitalists, grim. Neoliberals and neoconservatives evoke the threat of communism because it is real. So we shouldn't let the media screen deceive us. We shouldn't think that the charge that Obama is a communist and peace is communist fool us into thinking that communism is just an image covering up and distorting the more serious politics of global finance, trade, and currency regulation. That politics is hopeless, a farce. The attempt of financial and economic elites to come to some temporary arrangements conducive to their continued accumulation of capital. Communism, as the name for the end of and alternative to, communism, to capitalism, is real. So I've considered the right's relation to the communist threat. What about the democratic left? Whereas the right treats, treats communism as a present force, the left is bent around the force of loss, that is, the contorted shape it has found itself in as it has forfeited or betrayed the communist ideal. The rejection of communism shapes the left. Fragmented tributaries and currents, branches and networks of particular projects and partial objects are the left form of the loss of communism. Some think of this form as an advance. They name it democracy, envisioning struggles on the left specifically as struggles for democracy. Now, in some places, this could make sense, like in the French Revolution, the Haitian Revolution, in struggles against colonialism and imperialism, even in opposition to the authoritarianism of the party-state bureaucracies of the former East. In these instances, to stand for democracy was to stand against an order constituted against democracy. But in parliamentary democracies, for leftists to refer to their goals as a struggle for democracy is strange. It's not like they're fighting for rights to vote and organize. 
Democracy is our ambient milieu, the hegemonic form of contemporary politics, which is another reason that the right can name opposition to, to it communism. For the left to use the language of democracy now is as even stranger, a way of avoiding the fundamental antagonism between the top 1% and the rest of us by acting as if the only thing really missing was participation. The mistake leftists make when they turn into liberals and Democrats is thinking that we are beyond the communist horizon, that democracy replaced communism rather than serves as the contemporary form of communism's displacement. Leftists don't see, can't acknowledge, our complicity in despotic financialism. If political struggle is always an irreducible dimension of capitalism, and capitalism is always interlinked with conflict, resistance, accommodation, and demands, then refusals to engage in these struggles, rejection of the terms of these struggles, will affect the form capitalism takes. For example, Luc Boltanski and Yves Chiapolo and analyze changes in management language from the 60s to the 90s. They document the dismantling of a class-based approach to work and the assembling of a new view of work in terms of individual creativity, autonomy, and flexibility. Personal benefits came to outweigh collective action, which had the effect of strengthening the position of employers. The resulting shift of responsibilities from organizations onto individuals undermined previous guarantees of security. The actuality of flexible employment was precarity, temporary work, subcontracting, project-based employment, multitasking, and opportunities contingent on personal networks, like art and NGOs. The point I want to emphasize is that a primary factor in the, in the changes in capitalism over the past 30 to 40 years has been a change in the understanding of work, a change from an emphasis on its class, group, and collective dimension to a view of work as a personal choice, endeavor, and locus of meaning. Individual work displaced work as a common condition, freeing capital from the constraints encountered when it had to deal with workers as a collective force. I've argued that for the left, democracy is the form the loss of communism takes. Rather than fighting for an ideal, engaging in a struggle in behalf of the rest of us, the left repetitively, repetitively invokes democracy, calling for what is already there. Left appeals to democracy thus look a lot like the Lacanian notion of drive. For Lacan, drive, like desire, describes the way the subject arranges its enjoyment, jouissance. In the economy of desire, enjoyment is what the subject can never reach, what the subject wants but can never get. Oh, that's not it. In the economy of drive, enjoyment comes from missing one's goal. It's what the subject gets even if it doesn't want it. The subject's repeated yet ever-failing efforts to reach its goal become satisfying on its own. Democracy for the left is drive our circling around, our missing of a goal, and the satisfaction we attain through this missing. We talk, complain, and protest. We make groups on Facebook. We sign petitions and forward them to everyone in our mailbox. Activity becomes passivity, our stuckness in a circuit, which is then lamented and mourned as the absence of ideas or even the loss of the political itself, and then, yet again, routed through a plea for democracy, although it doesn't take a genius to know that the real problem is neoliberal capitalism and its extreme inequality. What leftists call the loss of the political is the fog they muddle around in because they've lost sight of the communist horizon. In the contemporary networks of communicative capitalism, drive is a feedback circuit that captures our best energies. Invigorating communism as a political alternative requires amplifying the collective desire that can cut through these affective networks. Fortunately, that desire is already there. Three, communism, the sovereignty of the people. I've discussed two ways of thinking about the communist horizon, the past Soviet experiment and the present force. I've described the present force of communism, moreover, via a right-left distinction between threat and loss a distinction which rests on a common supposition of democracy. The right thinks communism is a continued threat to democracy. The left is stuck in democratic drive as the actuality of its suppression of communist desire. In each instance, communism names that in opposition to which our current setting is configured, the setting within which despotic financialism unfolds. Now, why is communism that name? 
My argument is that it's that name because it designates the sovereignty of the people, the rule of the people, and not the people as a whole or a unity, but the people as the rest of us, those whose work, lives, and futures are expropriated, monetized, and speculated on for the financial enjoyment of the few. One way to explore this point is via Michel Foucault's insight into the limitation of sovereign knowledge crucial to economic liberalism. Liberalism's emphasis on the economic activities of individuals shot a hole through sovereignty. It said that there was a natural limit to sovereignty, a limit arising not from the rights of individuals, but from a set of natural dynamics and processes that the sovereign could not know. As Foucault points out, economic man is bound up in a world he can neither predict nor control. The unknown actions of one have effects on others in ways none of them can know. Yet, and here is the mystery of economic liberalism's invisible hand, in precisely these conditions of collective blindness, each can benefit. In fact, these conditions of collective blindness, we're told, are necessary conditions for each to benefit. Collective benefit can only be secured through the pursuit of individual self-interest. Moreover, just as individual economic actors cannot see the whole, neither can the sovereign. A visible hand would be no hand at all. It would be necessarily partial, distorted, and incapable of combining, combining the multitude of economic interests. Liberal political economy thus announces there is no sovereign in economics. There is no economic sovereign. Now, what sort of sovereignty is this? Foucault doesn't emphasize it, but we should keep in mind that it's the sovereignty of the people. A certain version of the economy, one focused first on the market and later on a narrow, odd notion of competition, is presented as a barrier to governance, as a limit on what government can know and do. Insofar as the emergence of this limit accompanies the spread of democracy in Europe, right, via the extension of, of suffrage and the institutionalization of mass parties, it's a limiting of the people, the rest of us, as a political force with the will to oversee, guide, direct, and organize economic matters. As Foucault makes clear, the limiting of the people as a common political force turns them from active agents of power into a passive population. For liberalism and neoliberalism, people are active only as individuals, little entrepreneurs or enterprises. What appears as the freedom of the market, then, is a foreclosure of the collective power of the people in and as a common. The power that matters to affect the basic conditions in which they live it just is displaced onto an economy that they are told they cannot govern because they cannot know. Giorgio Agamben raises, but doesn't linger on, a similar point. Noting shifts in the referent of the people from all to some, from a mythic impossible all of us to the division between the privileged and the rest of us, Agamben writes, it is as if what we call people were in reality not a unitary subject, but a dialectical oscillation between two opposite poles. On the one hand, the set of the people as a whole political body, and on the other, the subset of the people as a fragmentary multiplicity of needy and excluded bodies. The idea then is that the constitutive division within the people expresses itself in language. The term the people can refer to an imagined unity of everyone. It can also refer to the less well-off, the poor, the workers, the exploited, the majority whose lives and labor are expropriated to benefit the few. To appeal to the people in the second sense is to express and politicize a division between the few and the many, to make the many appear in their need and in their power. Unfortunately, Agamben's language confounds the reading of the division in the people I suggest. He splices together different images of division. That is, Agamben refers to two opposite poles and to a unified whole and what is excluded from it. The political problem thus shifts from an opposition within the people, between exploiters and the exploited, to one of being excluded from the people. And this, the political solution then appears as inclusion, and the initial matter of division and opposition within the people is effaced. Is effaced. A better way to conceive the division within the people, one capable of expressing the power of the people in and as a common, but not a whole and not a unity, makes use of the distinction between desire and drive. 
The people as desiring have needs, needs they can only address collectively as an act of common. The people as caught in drive are fragmented, dispersed into networks and tributaries. Stuck in drives, repetitive loops, they pursue their separate enterprises even as they are the governmentalized objects of population. I raise this criticism of Agamben not only as a way to get at a view of communism as the force of the people as sovereign in the economy, I also want to emphasize that for communists, the binary inclusion, the binary inclusion exclusion does not and cannot indicate the primary axis of justice, although it functions quite nicely for liberal Democrats who insist that the true political issue is making sure that no one is excluded from opportunities to participate in the democratic process or from the possibility of striking it rich in the capitalist market. Now, there's disagreement on this point. Um, some emphasize refugees and migration. The remedy for those without papers um, is to have papers and thus membership in the state. This isn't a bad goal, but it's a goal that extends rather than takes or changes state power. Similarly, the remedy for those without property is a right to property a remedy that incorporates the owner into the official market economy, in effect eliminating the threat to the market that uncounted use and exchange pose. But is capitalism best understood as a system that, constit that constitutively excludes persons or one that constitutively exploits them? Building from Alain Badou and Jacques Rancière, Zizek claims that the antagonism between the included and the excluded is the fundamental antagonism rupturing capitalism today, and hence crucial to the idea of communism. Zizek recognizes that the focus on exclusion easy ally easily allies with the liberal, tolerant, multicultural topic of openness at the expense of a properly Marxist notion of social antagonism, yet he argues that the inclusion of the proletariat is an inclusion of a different sort, an inclusion of capitalism's point of symptomal exclusion, part of no part, that effectively dismantles it. A lot rides on the notion of proletariat here, especially since contemporary capitalism relies on communication as a productive force rather than industrial labor. On the one hand, in his account, Zizek detaches proletarian from the factory, treating proletarianization as a process that, that deprives humans of their substance and reduces them to pure objects. On the other, he identifies exclusion as a particular kind of proletarianization, one by which some are made directly to embody substanceless subjectivity. They are the material remainders of the system. It's unavoidable and, uh, and necessary byproducts. Because the entire system relies on their exclusion or their inclusion as remainders, because they embody the truth that capitalism produces human refuse, surf, sur surplus populations with no role or function, to include them would destroy the system itself. Now, Zizek's argument is compelling as it echoes and reinforces current sentiments around vulnerability, exposure, and bare life. That proletarianization is a process disconnected from industrial, from industrial labor, makes it feel unleashed as if any one of us at any moment were at risk. That some in particular embody our substanceless sub sub subjectivity is in a way a relief. Oh, I'm okay. Their specific vulnerability thus frees me to a kind of engaged generosity or care. Of course I want to include them, maybe as recipients of charity, or even through new worker training programs or short-term extensions of credit. To be sure, this isn't what Zizek has in mind, but the fluidity of the category of the excluded, the vagueness around exactly what they're excluded from and in what way, and the fuzziness of the meaning of inclusion in a global economic system Zizek himself terms real, make his argument more affectively than analytically satisfying. Part of the difficulty stems from Zizek's treatment of contemporary communicative capitalism as if it were a whole marked by a constitutive exclusion, where that exclusion designates persons as a part of no part. As Boltansky and Chiapolo and numerous others outline, the inclusion-exclusion binary today designates a relation not to a whole, but to a network. The excluded are those who are vulnerable because they are disconnected. They lack links to networks of opportunity, security, sustenance. If one thinks in terms of a network model then, there are no symptomal points. There are just more links. 
Links can be added or dropped with little impact on the network form. To be sure, this isn't entirely true. Networks can experience overload, instances of self-organized criticality when they disintegrate and collapse. But an image of network overload is not the same as that of a whole in its constitutive exclusion, particularly insofar as networks can often route around breakdowns. Zizek's treatment of the proletarian in terms of a part of no part or symptomal torsion of a system is a component of a larger endeavor to rethink the idea of communism today. Marxists have long identified the proletariat as the universal class, the subject object of history. In communicative capitalism, the idea of the subject object of history combines better with feedback loops, self-organized networks, and emergent formations where we are bringing ourselves into being as something new, where we are the objects of our work. We are already configuring our setting. The point is to do it differently, not for the enrichment of the few. Four, communism, the force of the common and commons. For a couple of decades now, many of us have been making something together. We've been linking and connecting, doing more than forwarding kitten photos. We've been building alliances and awareness, sharing knowledge of crimes, inequalities, violence of exploitation. At the same time, we've seen the right claiming their revolution, and we've been swept up in the reality of their counter-revolution. We've heard the neoliberals and financial despots claim that they are entitled to 90% of the wealth. We know, and because we are interconnected, we know that we know that they are wrong. It's not theirs to own. A crucial aspect of contemporary struggle thus relies on the assertion of the commons against claims to private ownership. A point some claim is justification enough for the renewal of communism. Theorizing the commons is tricky, though, because com contemporary capitalism is communicative. Capitalist productivity derives from, an ex from its expropriation and exploitation of communicative processes. Cesare Casarino's distinction between the common and the commons is helpful here. For Casarino, the common is another name for the self-reproducing excess that is capitalism. It's another name, but it's not the same thing. The common is not a thing or an attribute. It's a dynamic process. It is production. Glossing Michael Hart and Antonio Negri, Casarino writes, nowadays the common is virtually indistinguishable from that which continually captures it, namely, capital understood as a fully, that is, intensively and extensively global network of social relations. The idea becomes clearer in contradistinction to the commons. The commons is finite and characterized by scarcity. In contrast, the common is infinite and characterized by surplus. The common thus, thus designates and takes the place of labor power, Marx's um, source of surplus value, now reconceived in the broadest possible terms of the potential of creativity, thought, knowledge, and communication as themselves always plural, open, and, and productive. Now, how does the move from commons to common help us understand? exploitation and expropriation in contemporary capitalism? Well, at least one of the problems with the expropriation of the commons is that a few get a lot and some are left with nothing, thus having to sell their labor power. Privatization leaves them deprived of what they had. The widespread extension of credit, whether in the form of high interest credit cards, mortgage refinancing, or leverage in investment banking, is a kind of privatization of the future as it deprives the indebted of what they will have. The situation with the common is different. There is expropriation, but an expropriation that does not appear to leave many with little. There is more than enough, perhaps even too much. A question for the capture of the common in communicative capitalism, then, is the crime or harm. If there is abundance or surplus, why is expropriation a problem? Or is the problem some kind of exploitation, and if so, what kind? Now, I can't go into the variety of contemporary instances of expropriation and exploitation of the communicative common in here, but I want to um, talk about one version um, because I think it's worth noting as an iteration of the division within the people 
an iteration that exposes this division as a matter of exploitation rather than exclusion. And I call this network exploitation. It involves the basic structure of complex networks, um, which are networks characterized by free choice, growth, and preferential attachment. Um, and examples of these kinds of networks are academic citation networks, blockbuster movies, bestsellers, the, population, the popularity of blogs and websites, and I expect that um, the art world must work the same way. Um, complex networks follow a power law distribution. And what this means is that the item in the first place or the top has much more than the, in the second place, which has more than the third, and so on, so, such that there's very little difference between all of the folks at the bottom, but massive differences between the top and the bottom. Popular media express this idea as the 80-20 rule or the winner-take-all or winner-take-most character of the new economy. So lots of novels are written, fewer publish, fewer are sold, and only a very few um, become bestsellers. In this example, the common designates the general field out of which the one emerges. Exploitation consists in efforts to stimulate the creative production of the field in the interest of finding and then monetizing the one. Expanding the field produces the one. Um, or if you're a computer geek, hubs are an imminent property of complex networks. Such exploitation contributes to the expropriation of opportunities for income and paid labor, as we've seen in the collapse of print journalism and academic presses. At any rate, the basic idea here is that exploitation occurs not through the surplus value generated through the specific sale and use of labor power, but through the incitement of communication and the mobilization of networks in order to produce the one. We should be clear here, this isn't competition in the old political economy sense of pressures that discipline buyers and sellers, or the classical economic sense of the equilibrium of supply and demand. It's not even competition in the sense of games, contests, and rivalries. It's an arrangement of strength and chance for the emergence of the one. The instability of the distinction between common and commons also indexes exploitation in communicative capitalism. Um, there are a variety of examples here. Um, um, some involve um, spectacle, but I'm going to focus on just one attention. The myriad entertainments and diversions available online, or as apps for our phones, are not free. We don't usually pay money directly for Gmail, YouTube, Facebook, or Twitter. They don't cost money. They cost time. It takes time to post and write and time to read and respond. We pay with attention. Our attention isn't boundless. Our, our time is finite, even as we try to extract value out of every second. We don't have time to waste. We cannot respond to every utterance, click on every link, read every post. We have to choose, even as the possibility of something else, something wonderful, lures us to search and linger. Demands on our attention, injunctions for us to communicate, participate, share, even, which are ever shriller and more intense, are like so many speed-ups on the production line. Attempts to extract from us whatever bit of mind share is left. When we do respond, our contribution is an addition to an already infinite communicative field, a little demand on someone else's attention, a little incitement of an affective response, a digital trace that can be stored. We pay with attention and the cost is focus. This cost is particularly high for left political movement. Competition for attention, how do we get our message across, in a rich, tumultuous media environment, too often and easily means adapting to this environment and making its dynamic our own, which can result in a shift in focus from doing to appearing, that is to say, a shift from thinking in terms of getting, um, in, a, get, a shift toward thinking in terms of getting attention in the 24-7 media cycle and away from larger questions of building a political apparatus with duration. Infinite demands on our attention, demands we make on each other, and which communicative capitalism captures and amplifies, expropriate political energies of focus, organization, and duration vital to communism as a movement and a struggle. It's no wonder, then, that communicative capitalism is, particip is participationist. The more participation in networked media environments, the more traces to hoard and energies to capture or divert. I'm going to conclude with the fifth idea. 
communism, the actuality of revolution. So I've talked about communism as a loss and force and the force of loss. I've talked about it as a power in the commons and a common power. I want to close with a Leninist theme, the actuality of revolution. Now, one of my initial inclinations was to associate the idea of the horizon with the Derridian notion of democracy to come. Democracy in this conception can never fully arrive. It is forever postponed, deferred to come. That democracy cannot be realized as ostensibly a strength as it keeps open the possibility of deconstruction in the new. So conceived, democracy relies on a sort of gap that holds open a promise not to totalize, not to terrorize, a promise or commitment to futurity and the unknown. Any given decision or act will necessarily be lacking, but this very lack is the opening democracy demands. In contrast with such an openness, the Leninist party appears as a specter of horror, as the remnant or trace of the failed revolution, the terrors of which must be avoided at all costs. In such a vision, communism is reduced not simply to the actual, which is always necessarily ruptured, incomplete, irreducible to itself, and pregnant with the unrealized potentials of the past, but to the parody of one actuality, an actuality that itself has changed over time and from different perspectives. In such a reduction, which is an ongoing process, actuality is displaced by an impossible figure, a figure so resolute as to be incapable of revolutionary change. But what is the actuality of revolution? At a minimum, we can say that it involves change, confusion, disturbance, chaos, and the possibility wherein tendencies in one direction can suddenly move in a completely opposite direction. As the Hungarian um, philosopher George Lukács makes clear, for the Leninist party, the actuality of revolution requires discipline and preparation, not because the party can accurately predict everything that will occur, because it cannot, and not because it has an infallible theory, which it does not. Discipline and preparation are necessary in order to adapt to the circumstances. The party has to be consistent and flexible because revolution is chaotic. The actuality of revolution, then, is a kind of enabling impediment, is a condition of constitutive non-knowledge for which the party can prepare. It's a condition that demands response if the party is to be accountable to the people, if it is to function as a communist party. The actuality of revolution is the press, pressure that we feel, that we can't put off but must redirect. The communist revolution is what we must target and use as a guide if this, do, if this redirection is compelled by the force of the common rather than the speculation of the few.